I think a lot of what I was trying to do prior to starting Data Grail is watch other founders, other CEOs, other executives, and try to observe where they've hit potholes. I did like pothole observation for about a decade before starting the company. And what do I mean by that of, you know, there are many areas where you can fail in a company, right? Pricing, strategy, product, go to market. There are so many areas that you can fall down. And so just trying to figure out and document mentally, like model those out of when I'm driving down the road, how can I avoid the potholes that I observed other people hit? How much of success is really learning what not to do? Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm your host, Jeremy Bergeron, and today's guest, Daniel Barber, the CEO and co-founder of DataGrail, prepared for success by figuring out in advance what business potholes to avoid. Daniel explains that companies must understand the personal data that they hold and then strive to be transparent to necessary parties. He shares how his entrepreneurial path helped him understand this formidable task and eventually develop a better solution along with the other co-founders of DataGrail. Hey everybody, before we dive into this episode, we wanted to thank our partners at Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. To learn more, go to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. All right, back to Jeremy. What are you betting on for the future in terms of trends, tech, approach, strategy, any of those things? Yeah, so I think one thing is for sure, we will see more SaaS, right? <laughs> so just, <laughs> yeah. you know, people are going to invest in, in software. Um, and I think that is a consistent theme. It doesn't matter whether it's Data Grail or some other software people will buy more SaaS. Um, and I think product-led growth, i.e., you know, I can download a piece of software. That's a trend that's going to continue. Um, I think the other one is consumer awareness, right? So we had um, a, a report on, you know, California's Consumer Privacy Act and looking at the number of people that were engaging with businesses and asking for their information or asking for information to be deleted. That number as a percentage, right, has increased 2x over the last two years. So mm. our research suggests that now two times the number of people are requesting for their information. That is a trend I think will continue, right, meaning it'll increase mm. further. So, you know, I expect consumers are going to want their rights. Um, and then I'd say the third trend is, you know, um, privacy will start to go mainstream, right? We already saw that over the, the summer last year, right, with Apple and their billboards, right? Um, that right, pe right. companies will start to try to use privacy as a competitive advantage. And I don't see that slowing down. Salesforce puts out this state of marketing report. Um, they interview a bunch of marketing leaders and executives and some really interesting data comes back from that. And I just wanted to ask you a question around um, customer expectations. And certainly this is something that I know that you've experienced as well in your industry. Um, the, the stat goes... 72% of marketers say meeting customer expectations is more difficult than it was a year and change ago. Um, how has this played out for you and, and what is your team at Data Grail doing to tackle the consistent challenge of rising customer expectations? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jeremy. So I think the the area that's that's challenging for the CMO and the modern CMO in particular is you know, there there are more campaigns that are moving online, right? So we are thinking about a, as always, right, an offline and online experience, but more campaigns are now running online than ever before, right? The, the age of, you know, operating offline campaigns still works and they're very effective, but we really need to think about our digital campaigns. And I think that's a trend that's been going on for quite some time. Um, if you look at data from from G2, right, a, a service that, that tracks the number of applications, um, the modern marketing organization in the enterprise is now using over 100 different applications in marketing, right, which that in itself just creates, um, creates a challenge um, because, frankly, the consumer, right, the two of us um, are quite skeptical about how, you know, marketing organizations are using those applications. And the awareness of um, how our information is being used has increased significantly over the last few years. And so I think 
you know, we're, we've entered this age of privacy, but really what we're, what we're seeing, right, is a, a sense of skepticism of how businesses are using our information. And the modern CMO is going to continue to struggle with that because ultimately they need to be transparent with their um, consumer or employee or whoever the constituent may be that they're, they're looking to target. Because if they're transparent, ultimately that leads to trust for the consumer, which is really what we're talking about, right? A, a challenge around trust. For our audience, will you describe the company and kind of what you do there as CEO and co-founder? And then how does that platform help its clients comply with data privacy regulations and promote trust between its clients and their customers? Yeah. So we founded DataGrow in, in, in 2018, and we can certainly talk more about the, the, the founding story. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, at a high level, what we see in organizations today is what we're talking about, right? Businesses um, are trying to deliver transparency and trying to create trust with their consumer and their employees and anyone else that they've collected personal information from. Um, and DataGrail provides that ability to businesses, right? So to understand the applications that they've purchased within the organization, um, understand areas that they're using personal information and how that's being processed, and ultimately give consumers, you and I, rights to request for our information or request our information is deleted or used in a different way. And so, you know, modern businesses really struggle in this area because, frankly speaking, most organizations don't actually know the applications that they've purchased. And this is a real challenge, right? Um, there are many studies that sort of suggest the number of applications an organization is using. Um, we've seen that that number is often, you know, half what's actually in place in an organization. So this is where data Grail steps in. Hmm. Now I, I want to dive into a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey because yeah. when I looked at your super interesting background, I mean, it's really interesting to see the, well, not only what you're doing in addition to being a CEO and co-founder, you're also on a bunch of advisory boards and, or you were, I think you're still on a bunch of boards, right? Some of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh -oh. Depending on how you're much time I have. Okay. Some. Okay. Today, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, you've also traveled quite a bit. I saw, I think the first thing I saw was you were, you know, doing some, you know, biz dev and management consulting uh, at a company called Ishida in Japan. Um, so I just want to hear the, the path of, of, you know, how did your entrepreneurial journey begin and, and then take us to kind of the early days of, of Data Grail? Yeah. So um, I come from very humble beginnings, right? My two parents were both teachers. Um, my mother is Australian. My father is American. Um, so, you know, I grew up in Australia. Um, I spent time in, in Michigan, actually, which is a, a strange path for an Australian to land in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Spent yeah. time there um, and then lived in Europe for a couple of years. Um, so I spent time in Germany and the Netherlands um, and then went back to Michigan. Um, I had lived in Japan previously as a child, studied Japanese in Australia in high school. And so I went and did my MBA in Japan um, because I felt that was the the right place to give me a different perspective on how business gets done. Um, and I really wanted to work for a Japanese company, right? I just think that, you know, Japanese business is, is really conducted very differently to business that we do today in, in the US. Um, and I think many learnings from that of just, you know, how intercultural communication happens. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that allowed me to have a yeah, different perspective on things. So, Worked for the Japanese company. Um, they actually placed me in, in San Francisco. So fortuitous for me, probably not so much for, for them. Um, you know, there are lots of great companies in San Francisco. Uh, and so, you know, I did 14 trips to, to Japan in 2011. And I said, you know what, maybe I work for, for a company stateside. Um, and so landed in a, a really great place called Responsus. Um, I knew that I wanted to start my own company. And so I was, I was very interested in how Responses was running as an organization. We got to work with some of the, the best marketing teams on the planet, right? So Responses, for those that are not familiar, you know, powered the email marketing campaigns for thing, companies like Nordstrom, Lufthansa, Whole Foods, really, really amazing marketing teams. And what I observed there, Jeremy, was that Businesses at this time in 2012 were increasingly using a large number of applications to run their business, 
right? So they would hook up responses as kind of the email execution software. And they would, you know, use other services to augment that experience. So to provide a tailored and personalized experience for you, when you get that email from Nordstrom, it would be a pair of shorts that, you know, are probably close to your size, are the correct gender, right? And, you know, are orientated to perhaps the weather where you are today, right? Um, and this was really cool. Like, I'm not going to lie, in 2012, I was, I was very impressed by what marketers were doing. But really no concept of privacy at this stage, right? Cambridge Analytica hadn't happened. It wasn't going to for quite some time. GDPR was, a, was, a, was not even thought of at this stage, right? There were prior EU data privacy sort of laws and regulations in Europe, nothing in place. Um, now, after the acquisition by Oracle, um, I followed this productivity track um, that was happening at the time in sales and go-to-market to a company called ToutApp. Um, and I followed the founder there and he convinced me to join his journey, Jeremy, and learn from, you know, what could be, um, what could be possible in a startup. And I think about this as kind of my startup MBA. Um, I learned firsthand from TK and he provided me guidance over two years of how to sort of build business. And, um, you know, we raced around through Andreessen Horowitz and frankly, I thought we were going to win, right? It was, you know, very naive at the time. And I, I thought this was the path to success. What I would say is that I learned firsthand that, you know, um, one, <laughs> that's not necessarily the case. Two, um, also, you know, entering a market first is not always the best place to be. Now that market is dominated by two companies, Sales Loft and, and Outreach. Both are billion dollar businesses. Um, and so being first is not necessarily the best path. Um, what I also learned there was, I signed 200 data processing agreements in 2015. Now, if you've ever read a data processing agreement, Jeremy, it's, uh, it's, it's not a very exciting document. <laughs> it's about 20 pages. And if you do that 200 times in a, in a calendar year, you start to wonder why you're doing it. This, again, was pre-GDPR, right? Pre-Cambridge Analytica, 2015. Uh, and so through that time, I kind of realized that businesses cared a lot about the liability related to you know, privacy regulations. And in particular, this seemed to be increasing in importance. And so by the time I got to the next company, I met my two co-founders there, and it became very clear by the time 2017 came around, businesses had no idea what applications they purchased. They had no idea of the personal information they'd collected on you and I. And that's a problem because you and I were becoming aware that consumers had rights. Um, and so these two things as axes did not align, right? Businesses don't know what they've collected about you. And you and I want control over that information. Someone needs to solve that problem. And that's why we exist. Wow. So what was it like in the, in the, in the early days of the company? I mean, you know, I, lo I love how the the problem became very real to you. And, and also like you, you wanted to insert yourself into the solution to that problem, which was wonderfully timed. Um, but what was it like in the early days? I mean, you've had that experience that it's a tout app was the name tout app. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, so a lot, a lot of momentum, a lot of experience. And I love that you had the sales background, which I think is also really important to, to lead an organization, like having that in your wheelhouse and being a part of a lot of growth and scale, but what was it like for you kind of, again, now you're launching off, now you're going to start your own thing. Talk us through some of the early day lessons and how, what that experience was like for you. I think what's interesting when starting a company, um, many people make the assumption that the CEO or the founder has everything planned out, right? Um, <laughs> and of course knows all the answers. This is just completely not the case, right? Like, let's be honest. Um, I think a lot of what I was trying to do prior to starting to Data Grail is watch other founders, other CEOs, other executives, and try to observe where they've hit potholes, right? So I did like pothole observation for about a decade before starting the company. And what do I mean by that of, you know, there are many areas where you can fail in a company, right? Pricing, strategy, product, go to market, building the product. Um, there are so many areas that you can fall down. And so just trying to figure out and document mentally, like model those out of when I'm driving down the road, how can I avoid the potholes that I observed other people hit, right? Um, because there are some general rules that apply 
both in hiring, in developing talent, in developing products, and taking it to market that do apply across most industries. And so that's what I kind of like tried to pick up in the early days, right? Um, as well as trying to get as much customer feedback as possible, right? Because the best product is really driven by one, how do you think about solving the problem of the customer, right? So just obsessing over the problems that the customer has to the nth degree so that therefore you can provide a solution because they don't actually care about your product at all. And that's lost on many executives, I think, right? They think about their product as features and functionality. The, the end user actually doesn't care about the features at all. They just want mm. to solve their problem. And hopefully your solution does that. Was it, was, it a noisy, was it a noisy landscape competitively four years ago? Were there a lot of players in the space? Like, or did you feel like, you know, based on what you had observed at the time in your, in your pothole observation, which I love that, by the way? So what's interesting, right? We were obviously not first to market. Um, and I think that plays to our advantage in this case. Um, so there's advantage of coming in second or in third generation. So that, that helps. Um, what's very interesting is now, you know, people will tell me, especially in the sphere of, of privacy. And, you know, recently we just had our, uh, a conference at IEPP. So the International Association of Privacy Professionals, it was in DC, keynoted by the CEO of, of Apple, right? So Really great conference. And there are a few vendors there, I'd say, you know, maybe a hundred, right? Um, and look, this is this is interesting. Uh, coming from MarTech, right, which is where TowerDap is and was. Um, and, you know, I think about Chorus and Outreach and other organizations that I've been involved with. There are 8,000, 10,000 vendors across that, right? Um, you know from talking to many CMOs, right, it is a battle in the MarTech ground um, with vendors that have overlapping technology everywhere. Uh, and so I just find it very interesting. People describe to me, oh, it's competitive in privacy, right? Um, relative to, to other you know, markets, it's early days. People are still just trying to figure out what are the most important problems and how do we solve those? I want to circle back quickly to the the connection to Japan again, and just kind of Ooh, how that's yeah. how how that's influenced you. I mean, because when I when I hear that you were in Japan and 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 working there and collaborating there, you know, and I see that culture, I've not been there. I do desire to visit, and I will. But there seems to be a rigor and a discipline, certainly in that culture. And so I'm just curious if you could touch on kind of how that experience has informed you as a CEO, as also a marketer and a co-founder, some of the things that you've really taken to put into your tool belt, things you observe there that maybe didn't exist really in the West? Yeah. So one area that I find interesting, we've, we've obviously been a values driven business, right? Values have been installed in the business from day one. I think it's the underpinnings of what drives a successful company, right? If you don't have values established, when you have disagreements, which you always will, right? If you don't have disagreements, that's actually a problem. You need to be having, you know, effective conflict and resolution in the business to actually drive the best growth. Now, if that's assumed, right? So you have values. Um, one of our values is iterate and evolve. Now, um, that, if you go back to it, right? Um, every data grail employee is issued a copy of the lean startup, Um and another book that's issued is Why We Sleep, right? Um, because sleep is very important. Um, and But if you think about the, the lean startup, that concept is really from Kaizen, right? The Japanese concept of continuous improvement. And so I think the Japanese figured that out, that it was very effective. It's built into their cultural DNA as well about, you know, incremental change, Um Often in the U.S., there's, you know, a lot of frustration around incrementalism and people are often critical of this field. Um, I actually think it's, it's, it's powerful when it's applied to execution, right? If you can ensure to, that you can improve something in small amounts and maintain and keep the original things that were working, there's no reason to scrap it scrap whatever you know you started and just start over again right um and so you know as a business we've adopted this value as a company of iterate and evolve 
but it really like stems from Kaizen and some of the frameworks that I used in, in Japanese business while living in Japan. What was, what was kind of an early days win for you after launching data grail? I mean, just, you know, just deciding to, to launch is that's great. Doesn't mean you're going to be yeah. successful. Doesn't mean you're going to win. What was kind of an early days win where you were like, okay, like your first moment, like as a CEO where you were like, yes, we're on to something. What's the story around that? Yeah. Yeah. So in the first 90 days of starting the company, we had angel round funding, Jeremy, like we were a very small company, right? We had, you know, no institutional investors on the cap table. This was a friends and family kind of angel round that we wrapped up from many folks in my network. And, you know, within 90 days, we had a publicly traded company using our platform. And one of the, um, you know, most prominent Decacorns um, listed today, right? In, wow. in infrastructure. And, I would say like, as we signed on both of those and both of them came from really no personal relationship, um, I realized that like fundamentally, this was a problem that was going to be uh, a challenge for businesses now and for the next decade or even two, right? And I think that was very interesting because, um, you know, many businesses start off by very small businesses as customers, right? They start an SMB and they try to, validate a, a problem you know we were three founders and a, a co-working space and we had you know a publicly traded business as a customer and a, a very fast growth uh you know infrastructure company as a customer and both of those two we had no business working with those companies um but they needed our solution and we were the best solution in market even as a three-person company wow can you touch on the relationship between the all the, the three founders, just what, what that's been like for you uh, now, of course, for your four years down the road. So I think, you know, realizing and recognizing that you likely need a co-founder to run a company. Um, that was a learning I watched of two companies prior to data Grail. So that pothole example, right? I watched two founders struggle through the scenario of being a solo founder. Um, so much so that I think one of them probably wouldn't invest in a solo founder today, right? Recognize that they actually need a founder. And I think most founders need a partner, right? That is very important, at least one, um, to go through the journey together because it's hard. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think, you know, for, for us, what was interesting, right, is we all came from um, backgrounds of third-party applications and had seen these challenges, right? So, um, one co-founder, Ignacio, um, spent, you know, four years at HP labs, a couple of years at Facebook in 2008. And so you can imagine he had seen everything, uh, from a personal information standpoint, right? Facebook using significant personal information to drive business. Um, the other co-founder, Earl, over a decade in ad tech, um, data scientist by trade. And so, uh -huh. you know, yeah. So between the three of us, right, my background in email one in ad tech and one in Facebook, right? And a few other businesses too. Combining those three, we all observed the same trend. Businesses are going to use more technology and continue to deploy that year on year on year. And every VC in, you know, across the country is going to continue to sponsor that behavior. That's great. That makes privacy harder every day forward because businesses will continue to buy software, which means you and I are not getting the rights that we deserve. Mm. Let's, let's touch on, on data privacy and compliance on an international scale. You, you wrote a piece in 2021 uh, in TechCrunch called Navigating Data Privacy Legislation in a Global Society. What is the current state of legislation concerning data privacy internationally? And then what's changed since you wrote that piece? Uh, the TODR version, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think anyone listening probably will laugh and, and, and probably agree. Um, it's really hard, right? Um, if you're a marketer, as many folks probably listening to this are, you know, what are you supposed to do with individuals that are European citizens traveling to the U S and visit your website? And now they're on a temporary visa and, they request their information or, you know, you are setting up a website and you're trying to understand when you need to provide consent. How does that work? 
the depths of consent, because it's not just for cookies, right? There are other areas that you need to provide consent. What is the definition of sale? So are you selling information? Do you have a loyalty program? If you are, you're probably selling information per California's Consumer Privacy Act. It is messy. Um, and I don't see it changing quickly, but there does need to be some global standards put in place. Um, because this path that we're going down is not a fruitful path for business or frankly the consumer um, where we might have you know 10 fragmented state level you know laws that businesses and ultimately lawyers need to navigate their way through to you know set up a website right today if you go to a website you'll see that it may list down the bottom a specific call out that says do not sell my information that's for California, right? California's Consumer Privacy Act. Well, some of the other state laws that have just passed or are in progress have similar constructs. So does that mean we have another link for those states? Just practically speaking, how does that actually work on a website? I don't really know. I don't know what the answer is there. Um, what I can tell you that we're seeing though, which is interesting, right, is data grail customers and most businesses we speak with are honoring the rights that you and I have no matter where we are. So the right to have control of our information is being honored by most businesses no matter what location you live in. So there's becoming a global standard of rights that you and I have because businesses just have no other choice, right? They can't provide specific rights for you when you're in this state and then you're in a different one, they're going to adjust. That just doesn't work. But also I would say the trend there, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, our research in this area, we put out a report on, on CCPA trends. Now, we've run this report, I think we're in our third or fourth time now. You'll find it on our website. The number of people that have exercised their rights to understand the type of information that a business has about them has increased 2x in two years. And locations of where people are submitting those requests is also all across the country. So it's not just CCPA, right? It's not just Californians. So I think where do we need to go to go back to sort of your question? We are going to have to navigate to a place where this forms some legal standard and then also technical standard of how do we actually deliver on the expectation that consumers have now about businesses and how they use their information. What do you think it's going to take to get that global some kind of global standardization or, you know, we've had Cambridge Analytica, we've had a lot of these, you know, you know, n newsworthy, Meltdowns. noteworthy things that have, right, exactly. So it's like, we clearly know that there needs to be some sort of rigor applied to this and, and, and hopefully soon. And I understand yeah. that it's also, it's also messy and all over the place, but what do you think has to happen to get this globally? Like, you know, that's huge. It's interesting you ask that. So I think if you think about why regulations exist, right? Why do governments push forward something? Um, they push forward because the constituents will vote on it. If you live in California, you likely saw Prop 24. It was in the last election, right? It was in the Section 24. I actually am a citizen here, so I got to choose you know, what my position was on Prop 24. And this was related to privacy rights for Californians, right? The advancement of those. Now, why does the government do that? The government steps in because consumers expect it. Regulation doesn't lead, it follows. So if that construct is true, then business and consumer sentiment actually drives regulation. And we saw this, right? Last summer, Apple with their strong position on privacy mm -hmm. and trying to use privacy as a competitive advantage in the market. And one could argue they still are because Tim Cook spoke at the IEPP last week, right? That position Apple is taking is a position of competitive advantage. And I think we will see brands take that position, which then means governments need to respond. They have no choice. Their constituents will force regulation to be put in place and mm. standards will be forced by business because they can't operate any other way. So I think actually you'll see the business community rally around some form of standard and consumers will accept that standard and therefore governments will respond. Governments are in response to consumers' expectation. That makes sense. Regulation follows versus leading, and that, yeah. that makes a lot of yeah. sense. I, I like that. Um, 
In terms of just consumers concerning privacy, kind of overall, what are consumers desiring concerning privacy? I think it's actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, some of the changes that you see Apple making in the way that they operate their app store and the way they allow apps in the, the app store to, to operate and process personal information, this is, this is really, again, in response to consumers' expectation of just two things, control and transparency. Ultimately, like you and I want control of our information and how a business is using it. That's expected. And you're actually very comfortable providing more information. So if you think about an example like Netflix or Stitch Fix, right, that are using concepts around zero-party data and trying to gain preference information about the user and and drive the user to actually make those suggestions themselves, that the consumer is comfortable doing that. Like I want an experience that's personalized on Netflix. So I, I hope that Netflix actually promotes shows and you know, suggest shows that I'm interested in watching. And I'm comfortable giving Netflix more information to do so. And I think the consumer is actually very comfortable with that as long as they understand how it's being used, right? So transparency into, I gave you that information. Did you share it with 45 other vendors, not Netflix? Because if you did, I'm probably not that comfortable with that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? If you didn't, or maybe you did, and that informs other areas of my life that improve my experience, then I'm okay with it. Actually, that's fine. Yeah, I, I'm still I still experience this today. Uh, no, it's I'm not the only one where I end up on email lists, you know. And I'm like, where? How did I? I mean, yeah. I, literally before this interview, I unsubscribed to five or six just on the, how I got. I mean, how did you get me? How did you get my information? Why are you marketing to me? I did not ask for this. Yeah. Still yeah. so pervasive today. So I'm oh, sure yeah. it's yeah. And it happens in other channels, Jeremy, too. Right? Let's be. Let's be really honest here. Um, how many text messages have you received or WhatsApp messages, right? WhatsApp is supposed to be a secure platform, but I seem to get people promoting their wares on WhatsApp pretty much daily at this point. I'll get random people trying to send me messages. I've never met them on WhatsApp before, and of course I blocked them, but where did they get the information in the first place? I have no idea. Right. How do I stop that? I have no idea. Right. Well, you know, people may, of course, have different takes concerning privacy in different countries around the world. From your perspective, where in the world right now would you say that consumers are putting the most pressure on companies and potentially the government to ensure their privacy? Is the U.S. where, you, where it's most heightened or are you seeing other countries that are even even putting more pressure? I think Europe has had the lead for a long time, right? They've been ahead, you know, EU privacy directive, which predated the GDPR was put into place long before, you know, anything in the U S with substantial teeth. And I think we will see this trend continue, right? Um, Europe has had a forward position on privacy for a long time. Um, and the U S is really catching up. To be honest, there's been a lot of press um, in the New York times. In fact, this week of, you know, hey, like US is behind. We don't even have a, a, a countrywide regulation. We don't have a standard. Um, it's pretty pathetic, to be honest, that we're here. Um, but it's, it's a byproduct of it's complicated, right? When you've got 50, 50 states and all, you know, folks trying to operate differently and you've got, you know, elections in states and then you've got, you know, differing uh, opinions politically and privacy being potentially a politically sensitive topic. It's, it's hard. Um, so not not uh, diminishing the work of our regulators at all. I think it's it's challenging work policymakers have to try to drive reform. Um, but I think we need to see a standard in the US similar to what the EU has, because frankly, the constituents expect it at this point. Mm. Do do you have examples of industries that are that are much further ahead in terms of compliance concerning privacy? and other industries that have some catching up to do? So, you know, if you think about like um, protected information within healthcare and financial information, there are laws and legal constructs in these fields that have existed for quite some time. We all know HIPAA and what that means, right? And we know that our, our medical information is mostly protected. Um, and businesses have very strict, clear standards around how they process that information. And those are commonly commonly uh, considered, right? There's people understand that HIPAA is the standard across the United States, and therefore you need to be very conscious of how you operate when you're processing information within healthcare. Um, I think 
there's just not the same thing for personal information as a whole. There should be, but there is not. Um, and I think we'll see the same trend follow, right? HIPAA created a standard. We need something similar for privacy. You, you've discussed zero trust data in an article that you wrote in VentureBeat called Three Data Privacy Trends to Watch in 2022 and Beyond. Can you describe zero trust data for our audience and how it's different from first party data? Yeah, so I think, you know, zero trust is really about uh, the collection of, of information that the user is very supportive of providing, right? Um, in fact, they'll actually like continue to add more. It's the example that I gave earlier of actually, you know, if you're, you know, my wife is, is pregnant right now. Um, she's a, a happy stitch fix customer. Um, anyone that works at stitch fix is, you know, great, great work. Um, I think the, the thing that's interesting is in her circumstance, she's very comfortable to provide the business more and more information about her preferences. And that allows the business to then, you know, do programmatic advertising of those, those preferences. And I think that's, that's a great thing, right? That actually leads to better marketing, better experiences, um, I think that's where we go. Do I think that happens in the short term? No, right? Because marketing organizations have got to catch up to that position, right? Um, historically, it's about collect, collect, and, and buy as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, that, that trend will change, and it has to because there's skepticism about how businesses have collected personal information. And first-party data that you've just you know, derived through your website, right? You can do more than that. Um, you can ask preference information to actually drive a better experience. Congratulations, by the way, on the on the new one coming soon. Thank you. What's next for for Data Grill? So I think this year is is very exciting, right? I think the trends within privacy are really starting to solidify. Um, there's one thing that's not changing; it's not getting any easier, right? So while you know other markets may be improving, right, privacy doesn't get easier next year. It's required. Um, we are doing a remote recording today, right? It's required. Um, and so it's very well established at this point. And so it's starting to mature, which is really cool. We're starting to see some new entrants in the market, which is fantastic. Like very, really like, excited to see. Um, I think this year for us is really about business building, right? We have been under the radar for a little bit of time here. And you know, we've accumulated a, a large number of, uh, of logos. 40% of our customers are publicly traded. Um, but but now it's, you know, now it's the time where we are going to double the business on a pretty large headcount already. So, you know, looking at 75 employees, we get to about, you know, 130, 140 by the end of the year. It's a lot of growth. And so, um, you know, we're excited to kind of expand across the country and expand our position internationally as well. And so I think that's where um, this year is going to be fun. Like it's, it's the fun year. Mm, that's awesome. Well, you were, you were in a full contact sport that is entrepreneurship. So congratulations to you, you know, in the entire, in the entire team there at data grail, it's really exceptional. Are you ready to get into the lightning round? Let's do it, Jeremy. Okay, let's do it. Let me give a quick shout out to our sponsor of the show, Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce is the world's number one CRM. Uh, Marketing Trends is a podcast that's brought to the world by Salesforce. And so Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. For those who are curious, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. Number one, what are you betting on for the future? Could be personally or professionally. The number of applications and the proliferation of SaaS will continue for many, many, many years to come. If you have to build a marketing team from scratch, let's say tomorrow, your know, marketing team's gone, you got to build the team immediately. What role are you hiring first and why? Content. Um, and content because people want to hear stories, right? They engage with stories. They understand stories. It's what we've used for millennium to communicate to each other and, and describe scenarios that we're working with and our peers are working with. And so someone to create those stories is always who you start with first. Mm, I love it. Daniel, what impresses you? Execution. Mm, love that answer. Uh, if you had access to a time machine, 
where and when would you go? Oh, this is tough. Um, I think there was an era prior to our time that was very, probably quite an amazing thing to see, right? Where, you know, communication wasn't immediate, right? Um, I'm fortunate to go through the period where, you know, the internet didn't really exist in the mainstream as I was growing up as a child. And I kind of appreciate that. I'd love to, you know, go back further, I think, and go to a period where, you know, perhaps it's the the twenties, right? Post World War One, um, you know, a, a pretty positive outlook on the world, right? Um, and just like interesting themes happening during this period, right? lots of scientific sort of uh, changes, um, and you know, generally like a uh, a focus on family and and community that was less connected in the way that we are today. Hmm. What is success for you? I think about the customer maniacally. Um, that's kind of all I think about. I like solving problems and a business is a large problem. That's, that's all I work on is just solving the problem. Um, and I'll continue to work on solving this problem, which really means solving the customer problems of someone in privacy and what does that look like? And so until that's done, I'm going to keep working on this. What is your favorite app on your phone? On the home screen right now, it's probably cliche, but it's probably the Audible um, app. I okay. love um, reading and I found that, you know, uh, I have a, a pretty small apartment in San Francisco and the bookshelf takes up half of a, a wall, right? Which if I kept scaling with the way that worked without Audible, I wouldn't have a house. It would just be a house <laughs> okay. of books. It's not going to work. <laughs> nice. So I'm very happy to also be able to read at rapid speed, right? Listening is just such a beautiful thing you can do. And so, you mm. know, putting it 1.5, 1.75, it's just allows me to consume more information faster than a traditional book. Now I still love books. So I keep my books in my bookcase, but that's probably my number one app. What's the skill you believe everyone should have? You know, it's a funny one um, and sort of cliche too, but I think writing and specifically business mm. writing is um, is a thing that is just not taught in college education at all. Um, and it's like so critical at this point. If I'm going to communicate with you and, and you're going to communicate with me after this session, right, to say, hey, we've done the recording, like that skill of writing an email is just not taught business communication. Um, and I think like there is, there's such a wide array of, uh, of level there, right? It's a simple skill, business communication. Um, but to do it really well requires, um, some development. And I just, I don't see that in our, our tertiary education system today. If you could effortlessly pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? Um, probably to read faster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, All right. I already accept my speed, but I just want to read faster. If I okay, can like, okay. consume more information and try to turn it into to insight, right? That's powerful. Um, I, you know, learning to code, I, I, I can dabble, but I don't really know what I'm doing, right? Um, I, I, I lean on leaders and expert in that field, but um, that's interesting. I think like learning languages. I, I love language and that's probably another area where I would go. Last question. What is one thing you would like to do this year that you have never done before? I'm, I'm going to be a father this year. Um, and so I'm pretty excited about that. I love it. Great answer. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for being here again. This was such an honor. Congratulations to you and the entire team at, at Data Grill. Truly, um, I know this is just the, the beginning and there's more to come. So thank you for being on Marketing Trends. No, thank you, Jeremy. This is fun. Thank you again to Salesforce for making this show possible. If you want to learn more about Salesforce, go to salesforce.com forward slash marketing.